chapter seven, mainly about dwarves. The two Calarmine soldiers at the head of the column, seeing what they took for a Tarkin or great lord with two armed pages, came to a halt and raised their spears in salute. Oh, my master, said one of them. We lead these mannequins to Kalerman to work in the mines of the Tisarak. May he live forever. <clears throat> By the great god Tash, they are very obedient, said Tyrion. Then suddenly he turned to the dwarfs themselves. About one in six of them carried a torch, and by that flickering light he could see their bearded faces, all looking at him with grim and dogged expressions. Has the Tisarok fought a great battle, dwarfs, and conquered your land? He asked. That thus you go patiently to die in the salt pits of Pugarahan. The two soldiers glared at him in surprise, but the dwarfs all answered. Aslan's orders, Aslan's orders. He sold us. What can we do against him? <clears throat> Tisrock indeed, added one and spat. I'd like to see him try it. Silence, dog, said the chief soldier. Look, said Tyrion, pulling Puzzle forward into the light. It has all been a lie. Aslan has not come to Narnia at all. You have been cheated by the ape. This is the thing he brought out of the stable to show you. Look at it. What the dwarfs saw, now that they could see it close, was certainly enough to make them wonder how they had ever been taken in. The lion skin had got pretty untidy already during Puzzle's long imprisonment in the stable, and it had been knocked crooked during his journey through the dark wood. Most of it was in a big lump on one shoulder. The head, besides being pushed sideways, had somehow got very far back so that anyone could now see his silly, gentle, donkeyish face gazing out of it. Some grass stuck out of the one corner of his mouth, for he'd been doing a little quiet nibbling as they brought him along. And he was muttering, It was my fault. I'm not clever. I never said I was. For one second, all the dwarfs were staring at Puzzle with wide open mouths. And then one of the soldiers said sharply, Are you mad, my master? What are you doing to the slaves? And the other said, And who are you? Neither of their spears was at the salute now. Both were down and ready for action. Give the password, said the chief soldier. This is my password, said the king as he drew his sword. The light is dawning, the lie broken. Now guard thee, miscreant, for I am Tyrion of Narnia. He flew upon the chief soldier like lightning. Eustace, who had drawn his sword when he saw the king draw his, rushed at the other one. His face was deadly pale but I wouldn't blame him for that. And he had the luck that beginners sometimes do have. He forgot all that Tyrion had tried to teach him that afternoon, slashed wildly, indeed I'm not sure his eyes weren't shut, and suddenly found to his own great surprise that the Calarmine lay dead at his feet. And though that was a great relief, it was at the moment rather frightening. The king's fight lasted a second or two longer. Then he too had killed his man and shouted to Eustace, Where are the other two? But the dwarfs had settled the two remaining Calarmines. There was no enemy left. Well struck, Eustace, cried Tyrion, clapping him on the back. Now, dwarfs, you are free. Tomorrow I will lead you to free all Narnia. Three cheers for Aslan. But the result which followed was simply wretched. There was a feeble attempt from a few dwarfs, about five, which died away all at once. From several others, there were sulky growls. Many said nothing at all. Don't they understand, said Jill impatiently. What's wrong with all you dwarfs? Don't you hear what the king says? It's all over. 
the ape isn't going to rule Narnia any longer. Everyone can go back to ordinary life. You can have fun again. Aren't you glad? After a pause of nearly a minute, a not very nice looking dwarf with hair and beard as black as soot said, And who might you be, missy? I'm Jill, she said, the same Jill who rescued King Relian from the enchantment. And this is Eustace who did it too. And we've come back from another world after hundreds of years. Aslan sent us. The dwarfs all looked at one another with grins, sneering grins, not merry ones. Well, said the black dwarf, whose name was Griffel. I don't know how all your chaps feel, but I feel I've heard as much about Aslan as I won't do for the rest of my life. <clears throat> that's right, that's right, growled the other dwarfs. It's all a plant, all a blooming plant. What do you mean, said Tyrion? He had not been pale when he was fighting, but he was pale now. He had thought this was going to be a beautiful moment, but it was turning out more like a bad dream. He must think we're blooming soft in the head. That you must, said Griffel. We've been taken in once, and now you expect us to be taken in again the next minute? We have no more use for stories about Herzlin, see? Look at him, an old moke with long ears. <clears throat> By heaven, you make me mad, said Tyrion. Which of us said that was Aslan? That is the ape's imitation of the real Aslan. Can't you understand? And you've got a better imitation, I suppose, said Griffel. No, thanks. We have been fooled once, and we're not to be fooled again. I have not, said Tyrion angrily. I serve the real Aslan. <clears throat> Where's he? Who's he? Show him to us, said several dwarfs. Do you think I keep him in my wallet, fools? said Tyrion. Who am I that I could make Aslan appear to at my bidding? He's not a tame lion. Not a tame lion. <clears throat> the moment those words were out of his mouth, he realized that he had made a false move. The dwarfs at once began repeating, Not a tame lion, not a tame lion, in a jeering sing-song. That's what the other lot kept on telling us, said one. Do you mean you don't believe in the real Aslan, said Jill? But I've seen him, and he has sent us two here out of a different world. Ah, oh, said Griffel with a broad smile. So you say, they've taught you your stuff all right. Saying your lessons, ain't ya? Churl, cried Tyrion. Will you give a lady the lie to her very face? You keep a civil tongue in your head, mister, replied the dwarf. Oh, I don't think we want any more kings. If you are Tyrion, which you don't look like him, no more than we want any Aslans. We're going to look after ourselves from now on and touch your caps to nobody, see? That's right, said the other dwarves. We're on our own now. No more Aslan, no more kings, no more silly stories about other worlds. The dwarves are for the dwarves and they began to fall into their places and to get ready for marching back to wherever they had come from. Little beasts, said Eustace. Aren't you even going to say thank you for being saved from the salt mines? Oh, we know all about that, said Griffel over his shoulder. You wanted to make use of us. That's why you rescued us. You're playing some game of your own. Come on, you chaps and the dwarfs struck up the queer little march song, which goes with the drumbeat, and off they tramped into the darkness. Tyrion and his friends stared after them. Then he said the single word, come, and they continued their journey. They were a silent party. 
Puzzle felt himself to be still in disgrace, and also he didn't really quite understand what had happened. Jill, besides being disgusted with the dwarfs, was very impressed with Eustace's victory over the Calamine and felt almost shy. As for Eustace, his heart was still beating rather quickly. Tyrion and Jewel walked sadly together in the rear. The king had his arm on the unicorn's shoulder, and sometimes the unicorn nuzzled the king's cheek with his soft nose. They did not try to comfort one another with words. It wasn't very easy to think of anything to say that would be comforting. Tyrion had never dreamed that one of the results of an ape setting up a false Aslan would be to stop people from believing in the real one. He had felt quite sure that the dwarfs would rally to his side the moment he showed them how they had been deceived. And then the next night, he would have led them to Stable Hill and shown puzzle to all the creatures and everyone would have turned against the ape. And perhaps after a scuffle with the Calamines, the whole thing would have been over. But now it seemed he could count on nothing. How many other Narnians might turn the same way as the dwarves? Somebody's coming after us, I think. <clears throat> oh. <clears throat> Somebody's coming after us, I think, said Puzzle suddenly. They stopped and listened. Sure enough, there was a thump, thump of small feet behind them. Who goes there? shouted the king. <clears throat> only me, Sawyer, came a voice. Me, Hogan the dwarf. I've only just managed to get away from the others. I'm on your side, sire, and on Aslan's. If you can put a dwarfish sword in my fist, I'd, glad, I'd gladly strike a blow on the right side before all's done. Everyone crowded round him and welcomed him and praised him and slapped him on the back. Of course, one single dwarf could not make a very great difference, but it was somehow very cheering to have even one. The whole party brightened up. But Jill and Eustace didn't stay bright for very long, for they were now yawning their heads off and too tired to think about anything but bed. It was at the coldest hour of the night, just before dawn, that they got back to the tower. If there had been a meal ready for them, they would have been glad enough to eat, but the bother and delay of getting one was not to be thought of. They drank from a stream, splashed their faces with water, and tumbled into their bunks, except for Puzzle and Jewel, who said they'd be more comfortable outside. This perhaps was just as well, for a unicorn and a fat, full-grown donkey indoors always makes a room feel rather crowded. Narnian dwarfs, though less than four feet high, are for their size about the toughest and strongest creatures there are, so that Poggin, in spite of a heavy day and a late night, woke fully refreshed before any of the others. He at once took Jill's bow, went out and shot a couple of wood pigeons. Then he sat plucking them on the doorstep and chatting to Jewel and Puzzle. Puzzle looked and felt a good deal better that morning. Jewel, being a unicorn and therefore one of the noblest and delicatest of beasts, had been very kind to him, talking to him about things of the sort they could both understand, like grass and sugar and the care of one's hooves. When Jill and Eustace came out of the tower, yawning and rubbing their eyes at almost half past ten, the dwarf showed them where they could gather plenty of a Narnian weed called wild fresni, which looks rather like our wood sorrel, but tastes a good deal nicer when cooked. It needs a little butter and pepper to make it perfect, but they hadn't got these. So, <clears throat> so that, what with one thing and another, they had the makings of a capital stew for their breakfast or dinner, whichever you choose to call it. Tyrion went a little further off into the wood with an axe and brought back some branches for fuel. While the meal was cooking, which seemed a very long time, especially as it smelled nicer and nicer the nearer it came to being done, the king found a complete dwarfish outfit for Poggin. Male shirt, helmet, shield, sword, belt, and dagger. 
Then he inspected Eustace's sword and found that Eustace had put it back in the sheath all messy from killing the calumny. He was scolded for that and made to clean and polish it. All this while Jill went to and fro, sometimes stirring the pot and sometimes looking out enviously at the donkey and the unicorn who were contentedly grazing. How many times that morning she wished she could eat grass. But when the meal came, everyone felt it had been worth waiting for, and there were second helpings all round. When everyone had eaten as much as he could, the three humans and the dwarf came and sat on the doorstep. The four-footed ones lay down facing them. The dwarf, with permission both from Jill and from Tyrion, lit his pipe, and the king said, Now, friend Poggin, you have more news of the enemy, belike, than we. Tell us all you know. And first, what tale do they tell of my escape? As cunning a tale, sire, as ever was devoised, said Poggin. It was the cat, Ginger, who told it, and most likely made it up too. This Ginger, sire, oh, he's a sly boots if ever a cat was, said he was walking past the three to which those villains bound your majesty. And he said, saving your reverence, that you were howling and swearing and cursing Aslan, language I wouldn't like to repeat by the words he used, looking ever so prim and proper. Ah, you know the way a cat can when it pleases. And then, says Ginger, Aslan himself suddenly appeared in a flash of lightning and swallowed your majesty up at one mouthful. All the beasts trembled at this story, and some fainted right away. And of course the ape followed it up. There, he says, say what Oslin does to those who don't respect him. Let that be a warning to you all. And the poor creatures wailed and whined and said, it will, it will. So that in the upshot, your majesty's escape has not set them thinking whether you still have loyal friends to aid you but only made them more afraid and more obedient to the ape. What devilish policy, said Tyrion. This ginger, then, is close in the ape's council. It's more a question by now, sire, if the ape is in his councils, replied the dwarf. The ape has taken to drinking, you see. My belief is that the plot is now mostly carried on by ginger or rishda. Thus the Calamine captain, and I think some words that Ginger has scattered among the dwarfs are chiefly to blame for the scurvy return they made you. And I'll tell you why. One of those dreadful midnight meetings had just broken up the night before last, and I'd gone a bit of the way home, when I'd found I'd left my pipe behind. It was a real good one, an old favourite. So I went back to look for it, but before I got to the place where I'd been sitting, it was black as pitch there. I heard a cat's voice say, Mew, and the calamine voice say, Here, speak swiftly. So I just stood as still as if I was frozen, and these two were Ginger and Rishda Tarkin, as they call him. Noble Tarkin said the cat in that silky voice of his. Oh, I just wanted to know exactly what we both meant today about Herslin, meaning no more than Tash. Doubtless, most sagacious of cats, says the other, you have perceived my meaning. You mean, says Ginger, that there is no such person as either. All who are enlightened know that, said the Turkin. Then we can understand one another, purrs the cat. Do you like do you, like me, grow a little weary of the ape? A stupid greedy brute, says the other. But we must use him for the present. Thou and I must provide for all things in secret and make the ape do our will. And it would be better, wouldn't it? said Ginger. To let some of the more enlightened Narnians into our council. 
one by one as we find them apt. For the beasts who really believe in Aslan may turn at any moment and will, if the ape's folly betrays a secret. But those who care neither for Tash nor Aslan, but have only an eye to their own profits and such reward as the Tisrock may give them when Norni as a Calarmine province will be firm. Excellent, Cat, said the captain, but choose which ones carefully. While the dwarf had been speaking, the day seemed to have changed. It had been sunny when they sat down. Now Puzzle shivered. Jewel shifted his head uneasily. Jill looked up. It's clouding over, she said. <clears throat> it's so cold, said Puzzle. Cold enough by the lion, said Tyrion, blowing on his hands. And far, what foul smell is this? Phew, gasped Eustace. It's like something dead. Is there a dead bird somewhere about? And why didn't we notice it before? With a great upheaval, Jewel scrambled to his feet and pointed with his horn. Look, he cried. Look at it. Look, look. Then all six of them saw, and over all their faces there came an expression of uttermost dismay. Chapter 8 what news the eagle brought. In the shadow of the trees on the far side of the clearing, something was moving. It was gliding very slowly northward. At a first glance, you might have mistaken it for smoke, for it was gray and you could see things through it. But the deathly smell was not the smell of smoke. Also, this thing kept its shape instead of billowing and curling, as smoke would have done. It was roughly the shape of a man, but it had the head of a bird, some bird of prey with a cruel curved beak. It had four arms, which it held high above its head, stretching them out northward, as if it wanted to snatch all Narnia in its grip, and its fingers, all twenty of them, were curved like its beak, and had long pointed bird-like claws instead of nails. It floated on the grass instead of walking, and the grass seemed to wither beneath it. After one look at it, Puzzle gave a screaming bray and darted into the tower, and Jill, who is no coward, as you know, hid her face in her hands to shut out the sight of it. The others watched it for perhaps a minute until it streamed away into the thicker trees on their right and disappeared. Then the sun came out again and the birds once more began to sing. Everyone started breathing properly again and moved. They had all been still as statues while it was in sight. What was it? said Eustace in a whisper. I have seen it once before said Tyrion, but that time it was carved in stone and overlaid with gold and had solid diamonds for eyes. It was when I was no older than thou and had gone as a guest to the Tisrock's court in Tashbam. He took me into the great temple of Tash. There I saw it carved above the altar. Then that, that thing was Tash, said Eustace. But instead of answering him, Tyrion slipped his arm behind Jill's shoulders and said, How is it with you, lady? <clears throat> uh, uh, all right, said Jill, taking her hands away from her pale face and trying to smile. I'm all right. It only made me feel a little sick for a moment. <clears throat> it seems then, said the unicorn, that there is a real Tash after all. Yes, said the dwarf, and this fool of an ape, who didn't believe in Tash, will get more than he bargained for. He called for Tash. Tash has come. Where has it he, the thing, gone to? said Jill. North into the heart of Narnia, said Tyrion. It has come to dwell among us. They have called it, and it has come. Ho, ho, ho! chuckled the dwarf, rubbing his hairy hands together. It will be a surprise for the ape. 
people shouldn't call for demons unless they really mean what they say. Who knows if Tash will be visible to the ape, said Jewel. Where has Puzzle got to, said Eustace. They all shouted out Puzzle's name, and Jill went round to the other side of the tower to see if he had gone there. They were quite tired of looking for him when at last his large gray head peered cautiously out of the doorway, and he said, Has it gone away? And when at last they got him to come out, he was shivering the way a dog shivers before a thunderstorm. I see now, said Puzzle, that I really have been a very bad donkey. I ought never to have listened to Shift. I never thought things like this would begin to happen. If you'd spent less time saying you weren't clever and more time trying to be as clever as you could, began Eustace, but Jill interrupted him. Oh, leave poor old Puzzle alone, she said. It was all a mistake, wasn't it, Puzzle dear? And she kissed him on the nose. Though rather shaken by what they had seen, the whole party now sat down again and went on with their talk. Jewel had little to tell them. While he was a prisoner, he had spent nearly all his time tied up at the back of the stable and had, of course, heard none of the enemy's plans. He had been kicked. He'd done some kicking back, too, and beaten and threatened with death unless he would say that he believed it was Aslan who was brought out and shown to them by firelight every night. In fact, he was going to be executed that very morning if he had not been rescued. He didn't know what had happened to the lamb. The question they had to decide was whether they would go to Stable Hill again that night, show puzzle to the Narnians, and try to make them see how they had been tricked, or whether they should steal away eastward to meet, <clears throat> to meet the help which Runewit the centaur was bringing up from Ker Paravel and return against the ape and his calamines in force. Tyrion would very much like to have followed the first plan. He hated the idea of leaving the ape to bully his people one moment longer than need be. On the other hand, the way the dwarfs had behaved the previous night was a warning. Apparently, one couldn't be sure how people would take it, even if he showed them puzzle. And there were the Calamine soldiers to be reckoned with. Poggin thought there were about 30 of them. Tyrion felt sure that if the Narnians all rallied to his side, he and Jewel and the children and Poggin, puzzle didn't count for much, would have a good chance of beating them. But how... But how if half the Narnians, including all the dwarfs, just sat and looked on, or even fought against him? The risk was too great. And there was, too, the cloudy shape of Tash. What might it do? And then, as Poggin pointed out, there was no harm in leaving the ape to deal with his own difficulties for a day or two. He would have no puzzle to bring out and show now. It wasn't easy to see what story he, or Ginger, could make up to explain that. If the beasts asked night after night to see Aslan, and no Aslan was brought out, surely even the simplest of them would get suspicious. In the end, they all agreed that the best thing was to go off and try to meet Runewit. As soon as they had decided this, it was wonderful how much more cheerful everyone became. I don't honestly think that this was because any of them was afraid of a fight, except perhaps Jill and Eustace, but I dare say that each of them, deep down inside, was very glad not to go any nearer, or not yet, to that horrible bird-headed thing which, visible or invisible, was now probably haunting Stable Hill. Anyway, one always feels better when one has made up one's mind. Tyrion said they had better remove their disguises, as they didn't want to be mistaken for Calamines, and perhaps attacked by any loyal Narnians they might meet. The dwarf made up a horrid-looking mess of ashes from the hearth, and grease out of the jar of grease, which was kept for rubbing on swords and spearheads. Then they took off their Calamine armor and went down to the stream. 
the nasty mixture made a lather just like soft soap. It was a pleasant, homely sight to see Tyrion and the two children kneeling beside the water and scrubbing the backs of their necks or puffing and blowing as they splashed the lather off. Then they went back to the tower with red, shiny faces, looking like people who have been given an extra special good wash before a party. They rearmed themselves in true Narnian style, with straight swords and three-cornered shields. Body of me, said Tyrion. That is better. I feel a true man again. Puzzle begged very hard to have the lion skin taken off him. He said it was too hot, and the way it was rucked up on his back was uncomfortable. Also, it made him look so silly. But they told him he would have to wear it a bit longer, for they still wanted to show him in that get-up to the other beasts, even though they were now going to meet Runewit first. What was left of the pigeon meat and the rabbit meat was not worth bringing away, but they took some biscuits. Then Tyrion locked the door of the tower, and that was the end of their stay there. It was a little after two in the afternoon when they set out, and it was the first really warm day of that spring. The young leaves seemed to be much further out than yesterday. The snowdrops were over, but they saw several primroses. The sunlight slanted through the trees, birds sang, and always, though usually out of sight, there was the noise of running water. It was hard to think of horrible things like Tash. The children felt, this is really Narnia at last. Even Tyrion's heart grew lighter as he walked ahead of them, humming an old Narnian marching song, which had the refrain, Ho, rumble, 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 drumble, labored. After the king came, Eustace and Poggin the dwarf. After the king came Eustace and Poggin the dwarf. Poggin was telling Eustace the name of all the Narnian trees, birds, and plants which he didn't know already. Sometimes Eustace would tell him about English ones. After them came Puzzle, and after him, Jill and Jewel walking very close together. Jill had, as you might say, quite fallen in love with the unicorn. She thought, and she wasn't far wrong, that he was the shiningest, delicatest, most graceful animal she had ever met, and he was so gentle and soft of speech that, if he hadn't known, you would hardly have believed how fierce and terrible he could be in battle. Oh, this is nice, said Jill just walking along like this. I wish there could be more of this sort of adventure. It's a pity there's always so much happening in Anya. But the unicorn explained to her that she was quite mistaken. He said that the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve were brought out of their own strange world into Narnia, only at times when Narnia was stirred and upset. But she mustn't think it was always like that. In between their visits, there were hundreds and thousands of years when peaceful king followed peaceful king till you could hardly remember their names or count their numbers, and there was really hardly anything to put into the history books. And he went on to talk of old queens and heroes whom she had never heard of. He spoke of Swan White the Queen, who had lived before the days of the White Witch, and the great winter, who was so beautiful that when she looked into any forest pool, the reflection of her face shone out of the water like a star by night for a year and a day afterwards. He spoke of Moonwood the Hare, who had such ears that he could sit by cauldron pool under the thunder of the great waterfall and hear what men spoke in whispers at Care Paravel. He told how King Gale, who was ninth in descent from Frank, the first of all kings, had sailed far away into the eastern seas and delivered the Lone Islanders from a dragon, and how in return they had given him the Lone Islands to be part of the royal lands of Narnia forever. He talked of whole centuries in which all Narnia was so happy that notable dances and feasts, or at most tournaments, were the only things that could be remembered, and every day and week had been better than the last. 
And as he went on, the picture of all those happy years, all the thousands of them, piled up in Jill's mind till it was rather like looking down from a high hill onto a rich, lovely plain full of woods and waters and cornfields, which spread away and away till it got thin and misty from distance. And she said, Oh, I do hope we can soon settle the ape and get back to those good ordinary times. And then I hope they'll go on forever and ever and ever. Our world is going to have an end some day. Perhaps this one won't. Oh, Jewel, wouldn't it be lovely if Narnia just went on and on, like what you said it had been? Nay, sister, answered Jewel. All worlds draw to an end, except Aslan's own country. Well, at least, said Jill, I hope the end of this one is millions of millions of millions of years away. Hello, what are we stopping for? The king and Eustace and the dwarf were all staring up at the sky. Jill shuddered, remembering what horrors they had seen already. But it was nothing of that sort this time. It was small and looked black against the blue. I dare swear, said the unicorn. From its flight, that is a talking bird. <clears throat> so think I, said the king. But is it a friend or a spy of the apes? <clears throat> to me, sire, said the dwarf. It has a look of foresight the eagle. <clears throat> Ought we to hide under the trees, said Eustace. Nay, said Tyrion, best stand still as rocks. He would see us for certain if we moved. <clears throat> look, he wheels. He has seen us already, said Jewel. He is coming down in wide circles. Arrow on string, lady, said Tyrion to Jill. But by no means shoot till I bid you. He may be a friend. If one had known what was going to happen next, it would have been a treat to watch the grace and ease with which the huge bird glided down. He alighted on a rocky crag a few feet from Tyrion, bowed his crested head, and said in his strange eagle's voice, Hail, king! Hail, Farsight, said Tyrion. And since you call me king, I may well believe you are not a follower of the ape and his false Aslan. I am right glad of your coming. Sire, said the eagle, when you have heard my news, you will be sorrier of my coming than of the greatest woe that ever befell you. Tyrion's heart seemed to stop beating at these words, but he set his teeth and said, Tell on. Two sights I have seen, said Farsight. One was Care Paravel filled with dead Narnians and living Calarmines. The Tisrock's banner advanced upon your royal battlements and your subjects flying from the city. This way and that into the woods. Care Paravel was taken from the sea. Twenty great ships of Calamon put in there in the dark of the night before last. No one could speak. And the other sight, five leagues nearer than Care Paravel, was Runewitz the centaur lying dead with a Calamon arrow in his side. I was with him in his last hour, and he gave me this message to your majesty, to remember that all worlds draw to an end, and that noble death is a treasure which no one is to, <clears throat> and noble death is a treasure which no one is too poor to buy. So, said the king after a long silence, Narnia is no more.